Nicola in, you get another half hour. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time that remains. We don't want to be bound by time, but at the same time, the kingdom is built with wisdom. And so, Father, just anoint, Lord, the word that comes forth today, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for all you've said and done already, Lord. It already feels a richness in the spirit. Amen. It's great to see you here, Renit, this morning, in, in the, again in the midst of your difficult days. But um, we rejoice with you in Tom's complete salvation, justification, sanctification, glorification with the Lord. But we're mindful of you and the family. Hallelujah. Matthew 16:18. The Lord says, "I will build." That's exactly what it says. <laughs> Matthew 16, and we need to uh, understand that the building program of the Lord is well underway. We're heading towards the final stages of the building program, and uh, the building program of God is this: He's putting the capstone in place, the headstone. He's putting the final touch of glory upon the body of Christ so that at the return of Jesus, the body is, is in the glory. Remember Ephesians 5, he comes back for a, not a defeated church, not a weak church, not a sick church, but a glorious church. And so what God is doing throughout the season in the kingdom, he's, he's putting uh, the things that are not of him, he's cutting off, he's burning off, he's getting rid of. And those who are in the building program, not everyone's in God's building program. Not everyone understands times and seasons. Not everybody listens to the voice of God. You've got many religious people who are in churches and maybe even amongst us this morning. I'm examining my heart as well. Religion just gets you doing the same thing over and over, over and over and then complaining when the results aren't different. About when you have the power of the living God connected, flowing into your own spirit and you are prophetically compliant, prophetically compliant hearing what the Spirit says and saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to build with that blueprint. Many people say, I love the prophetic, but they are not compliant to what's been said. It's like, oh, that was a nice word. Well, it's not meant to be a nice word. It's meant to be a building block. It's meant to be laying down the track so that we can move in the direction that God's declaring. And so I believe God is refining and he is, he's tightening up, as it were, so that we can get the job done in the time frame that still remains. Uh, time we think is forever and ever and ever but God has always worked in times and seasons. I often find that my, my mind goes back into the birth of the church because I believe when the church was birthed in glory then that is the model. Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is like a model for the body of Christ and uh, if we will just follow the building program God is bringing the church not only back to form a glory but there's a greater glory, a greater unity, a greater power not just localised where the church was birthed, but this is a worldwide move of the Spirit. And that excites me and thrills me. You know, the body of Christ, the church, it was, uh, it was conceived in eternity past. Church is not a new thing to God. God has always had in his heart the way of drawing men and women back to himself through Jesus. And uh, we find that eternity is where the church was conceived, but in time it was birthed. And I feel it's, it's a good thing to honour what God has done in the body of Christ. Now, the church has always had a present-day kind of weakness, particularly after the Dark Ages when the Word of God was withheld and people began to build by just you know, human principles and humanistic ideas and we, we uh, lost the anointing but we still have this outward form of religion. It's one of the greatest problems on the earth today is the force of religion, so powerful. However, the true church is rising up. Hallelujah. It's not so much what it looks like on the outside or the form that we take, it's what's happening on the inside of our hearts. What are you doing inside our hearts? Are we compliant to what's happening in the kingdom? And uh, that's the measure I, for myself, I have to keep coming back to scripture and saying that's the measure, that's the yardstick. You are not my yardstick, I'm not your yardstick. The church down the road is not our yardstick. The word of God and the person of Jesus, who is the word of God, is the only yardstick. So when we say Jesus be the centre, we mean it. But I add another verse, Jesus be the circumference, be the beginning and the end, be the Alpha and the Omega, be all, sum total of all truth and doctrine. If it's not around Jesus, it's off the mark. And we know that because we preach that. Someone the other day said, you should talk more about Jesus. I nearly fell off my chair. I thought that's all I ever talk about. As God is my witness. 
I do complain occasionally and then I correct myself and I get back online. But Jesus is the centre. Hallelujah. Amen. And no one disagrees with that this morning. So the body of Christ, conceived in eternity in the heart of God, birthed in time, is very precious to the Lord. It's his instrument to build a kingdom. But it's not the number one focus. How many times have I said that? The church is not the focus. The kingdom, or the king of the kingdom is the focus. And his building plan is the, is the focus. Yeah, we're kingdom builders. Prophetic people hear the word, apostolic people build a kingdom. With the word, whatever God is saying, that's the building material that we use. So with that in mind, we go right back to the birth of the church, the glorious birth as we see in Acts chapter 2. We see the, the, the fullness of the power and the glory, the apex of power the early church reached in those first couple of years, turning the world upside down. Now we can't go back in time because in terms of that it's finished, that season's finished, but there's a new season upon the church. And I believe that season is, get it right, here's the pattern, here's the blueprint, this is what I'm saying, agree with what I say and move with it, move with it, move with it, move with it. And I believe that momentum has already started and seen evidence of it in lots of lives, seen evidence all year this year at the corporate gatherings. But the corporate gathering is not the only way to measure it. It's the man standing in front of the mirror. Lord, am I moving? Is there a momentum in my heart? Is the passion for the king getting stronger and stronger? Is the fullness of the spirit my desire so I can build more effectively? All these questions we need to ask ourselves. Uh, We judge ourselves according to the scriptures. If you judge yourself, God won't have to judge. I learned that many years ago. Get in first, judge yourself. See whether we're actually doing what the the righteous should be doing and then we find the blessing of God is, is unhindered. So I see the birth of the church, Jesus saying in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And uh, we see that the work's begun. It's a fantastic, exciting work. Colossians chapter 1, here's the, the key of what should happen in church life. Colossians chapter 1, verse maybe 13. Colossians 1. Now this, this strange thing I said to you a couple of weeks ago, I lost my Bible. You know, in one sense it's, oh, that's a, you know, that's, funny. that's a funny one. But you know, when you've had a Bible for 15 years and you've underlined it and you put all, all the things in it, and I think that's a bit of an onslaught actually. And we've looked high and low. If you've got it, repent. <laughs> Give it back. Hallelujah. So Colossians chapter 1 talks about the, the fullness of the Lord Jesus. Pick it up in verse 13. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. Amen translated us into the kingdom of his Son, amen, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, amen, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, the visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence or he might have first place. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So we hear the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that before all things and all things consist in him and by him and through him. So this is the message of the church. The kingdom message is Jesus Christ is Lord of all. It's always been the message. And we oppose the world view that truth is relative. There are no absolutes. There's no definable boundaries. Uh, We oppose that spirit. That's a spirit of lawlessness. Matthew 24 says when that spirit engulfs the nations then you'll have full-on problems. We, I believe, entered into it. That's where you see anarchy in the street. That's where you see this incredible discontent amongst not just the youth. They just express it a bit differently. But this this like a disappointment in life is just flooding the nations. In one way, it's a fantastic opportunity for the church to rise up with the central message, Jesus is Lord. People will listen. They don't like the church bit, but they'll get the Jesus bit. Especially if we're walking in the power of who Jesus is. And number one, their full expression of Jesus is love. Before any other sign and wonder, it's if you don't carry the presence of his love, you've got nothing to say. If you don't love the people you witness to, you shouldn't be witnessing to them. The love of God is that which propels us to work the miracle signs and wonders by the Spirit. 
It's not the other way around. It's the love of God as we see in the pattern of Jesus. So the centrality of who Jesus is opposes this present day world view. Truth is relative, there are no absolutes and there are no boundaries. So our message of course is that the unifying centre of everything is Jesus Christ. The unifying centre of everything is the person of Jesus. Now you know that God is restoring things to his divine order. Acts 3 says all things are going to be restored and we see from the beginning of the church age uh, we go right back to the pluralism of many gods and uh, polytheism and people were into all sorts of spirit worship way back in Bible times but the early church with the truth of God rose up and preached the gospel of Christ. However, religious demons were released of course, they are on the earth and they began to water the message down, get the focus off Jesus Christ, onto hierarchical leadership, onto form, onto outward structure, onto all these things which form religion. And before long the uh, church entered into a time that's called the Dark Ages where the word of God itself was withheld and people were now encouraged to follow the pattern of man's leadership and the programming of, of religious behaviours. And we see from that, uh, that time of dark ages, everything was really rotten to the core except for the remnant of truth held in the hearts of true believers. It's a very sad time for the world. Even history records the sadness of that hour without understanding the spiritual roots of it. And yet there was a voice that rose up in the midst of it through the Catholic Church I understand some of us might have sort of things about all these forms of religion but Catholicism rose up and said one thing which is so very powerful, there is only one God. In the midst of polytheism, in the midst of this plurality, you can believe whatever you want, this is happening today, called, you know, like New Age religion, just whatever. Uh, In the midst of it, they rose up with one united voice and said, there is only one God. That revelation burst forth. And many were drawn back into monotheism and were serving the one true and living God. But then the hunger and the thirst of those who knew and have come to know the one true living God brought further revelation. Remember we said last two weeks ago if you were here that unless you have a voice formed in the wilderness God cannot make a way for you. Isaiah 40 says the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Your voice, my voice is formed in the wilderness. The cry is formed under pressure. You're going to have a happy, clappy meeting and nothing's really changed in our hearts, potentially, because everything's fine. But you go back into adverse circumstances and something on the inside of you starts to rise up and the cry is formed under pressure. So in one sense, praise God for the tests, trials and temptations, count it all joy because there's something forming in you that nothing else could form. I don't speak it all over you for 2014. <laughs> I sometimes want to lift the tests off people but it's not our job to do that. Neither is our job to carry their burdens. Our job is to stand and love and together we work through things. That's where maturity comes from. But out of that hunger and thirst, more revelation came. When you cry unto God, he will make a way for you. Hallelujah. Always will. Always will. But he must wait for the cry. We must call out and say, God, I need you and begin to ask, even very specifically. And uh, then we see the revelation of truth coming and we see the Protestant whole, Protestant formation of reformation but they were forming by the spirit hallelujah and the truth was coming, justification by faith a great revelation that came and you begin to search the scriptures the scriptures were being revealed line upon line precept upon precept, God's bringing back those revelations that were already there in the early church in those early years and from the uh, Protestant reformation, those who were hungry and thirsty for more, crying out for more and we see God moving in stages and times and seasons. It's important I say this because it will make sense of what I'm going to say at the end of this. So we don't go back to finding God building more denominations because he's not doing that anymore. We don't go back and say let's start another group because that's not happening either. What's happening from the early stages of that change from Catholicism and those who moved with revelation into Protestant belief systems and those who moved with that further into the holy evangelical traditions and the holiness movement as they called it and those who moved with that into Pentecostal revelation and and the speaking in tongues and then those who moved with that into the charismatic move which is not that long ago where denominations are all coming into the spirit and speaking in tongues and then God moving again into various emphases that were needed to restore all things And now we're we're moving into a phase where all the body that's coming out of different backgrounds is standing as one. 
That's when you're in the spirit. It doesn't matter where we came from, praise God for the journey, but now we're at the place where regional churches are standing together. Citywide churches are standing together. It's not fully evident in the natural, but it's in the spirit. The whole national church of Australia will stand together with one voice. We, We have got great clout when we speak in unity. We are still the majority of people. Do you know, according to Victorian statistics, on any given Sunday there are more people sitting in churches in this nation than the entire AFL or VFL, the whole football scene, attendance for the entire season. For the entire season. And that's statistically been proven. Of course, the media gives you, you know, sort of 80,000 people at the footy and Christians shrink and say, oh, if only we had that kind of support. Well, we got far more support. But, of course, that's not going to make media because it's, you know, whatever reason. So I thought that was pretty encouraging, not that it's necessarily measured by numbers. Guys always work with the remnants. But he does love everybody, so the more he wants, you know, he wants people to come into the kingdom. So I thought that was a rather outstanding. On any given Sunday, there are far more people, way more, it's not like an equal, far more people worshipping God in churches than the entire season of the AFL calendar. Hmm. (laughs) However, I'm not suggesting all those who are sitting in churches are necessarily growing in grace. (laughs) But still, from a statistic point of view, that's a bit of clout. At least it means there's a sympathy towards, there's an openness to And God can move in dead religion. You know revival actually births best in dead religion? The number of people who say, I'm going to withdraw when things aren't right, when there's no full-on fire, I don't want to be part of it. No, that's when you need to be part of it because the fire that you and I carry can actually ignite and it's very contagious, very contagious. Those who don't want their hearts to change, of course, will flee. But when the anointing comes, the light is seen best in dark places. Revival means a reviving of that which once burned but is now pretty well dead. So you see this from Catholicism when the deadness of religion hit, the Protestant fire burned. When Protestantism sort of settled down with their revelation but didn't want to grow with more revelation, things sort of lulled a bit but the fire burned for those who wanted more and God was propelling them on. It's not so much out, it's on. You know, they look back and say, I came out of it and out of it. Well, that's true but we moved into something and the Christian life is moving on and moving in. I'm saying this because today I believe with, and many prophetic voices would be saying the same thing, that the shift of the spirit today is not building the church or not building denominations or building a man-made structure, it's following the voice of the spirit. Those who are coming out of the wilderness, leaning on their beloved, just wanting more and more and more and more of Jesus. That's why things are looking different, things are shaping up to be different. Men and women are carrying this fire in their spirit Small groups are back in. I mean, this is the biblical pattern of Acts 2. House to house is back in. It actually never left God's heart because he knew that there's a certain anointing that comes in a small group where 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26 says, one has a tongue, one has a psalm, one has a hymn, one has a doctrine, one has a spiritual gift and the whole body is edified and everyone is supplying that which the body needs. Now, this is not new. This is old. People say, this is a new move. Well, it's a restoration of the old because God birthed the church like that. However, there were apostolic gatherings where there was apostolic revelation and information and there were visionary meetings where people were given the blueprints and so we find that there's this multifaceted approach to the kingdom. Unfortunately, when people say, well, I like that but I don't like that, what, we, what we're saying is that's right and that's wrong. What we could be saying is God is a God who moves that way and this way and that way and this way and that way so we can have a fullness. It's a healthy way. I have to constantly look back at my origins, the Methodist Church, and say, thank you, Lord. I've got to say thank you, Lord, for what became the left foot of fellowship rather than the right hand of fellowship. When the Holy Spirit came, it was becoming obvious we couldn't coexist in that environment. It it wasn't World War III. It was just like, well, how can two walk together unless we agree? So sometimes that leaves a wound because if you've been there, as our family were 30 years in the one congregation... It's not easy just to walk out and close the door. It's like that my friends and my family and my my upbringing and my, you know, my Sunday school and all these things were part of that, praise God, I can look back and celebrate it because if you can't celebrate the past, you are carrying possibly bitterness into the present. So anyway, this is my walk. I'm not telling you how to do it. 
But the Lord says you've got to be able to celebrate the past to be a good custodian of the present. Because if you're a nasty custodian of what I was saying because you've got roots of bitterness and you're biting the hands that are trying to reach out to you and you're criticising this and that, you're not a good custodian of the glory of God. That's not the nature of Jesus. You've got to keep coming back. How would Jesus do things? How would he do it? How did he actually move with the fullness of truth and glory and grace in the midst of uh, difficult circumstances? Remember, he was a root in dry ground. He, it wasn't easy for Jesus either, coming out of you know, the whole Judah culture, this revelation of truth. So Jesus knows how to do it for you and for me as well. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So the church is, I believe, now poised to do the very thing that the word of God has required that we do, that is build a kingdom and, and move with what the Spirit is saying in this hour. A shift in the Spirit, a wonderful thing. I believe all this year there's been a shift I can't even pinpoint when, but it just felt like the first Sunday in January something had shifted. Now, I don't put that on you. If you don't agree, that's fine, but others have suggested similar things. Anyone agree? Something's shifted. Certainly we've been crying for it, but something's shifted. So what's shifted? A shift in the spirit requires a shift of revelation from the word. It's not a feeling. It's not, oh, well, you know, it's, oh, I've had a New Year resolution and it's all going to be different. That's, that's you know, rubbish. It's, Lord, what's shifted in the spirit? What are you emphasising that's brought the shift? The only way I want to shift in the spirit is to follow what the Holy Spirit's actually revealing from the word. Otherwise, you know, you'll be running around in circles. Which reminds me, went to Myers and bought a pair of shoes. Got to tell it because it's so funny. And I thought, I'll show these young ones. They're red shoes. It doesn't matter if you're 60 something, you can wear little red shoes. Don't panic, they weren't high heels, they were just nice shoes. So I thought, right, Friday night, the red shoes are coming on. So undo the box, two red shoes, both right feet. How that kid got that job, I'll never know. And then I thought, there's some poor guy running around with two left feet. And of course what that happens when you've got two right feet <laughs> So this other poor boy from Balga, he's <laughs> What I'm saying is I don't want to walk around in circles. I want to move ahead with what the spirit is saying. The boy from Myers will get a visit tomorrow. I suppose some really deeply in the spirit person say, it's prophetic, Bill, it's prophetic. I have a vision. God says, wear them as they are. No way. Shift in the spirit, shift of revelation, shift of what God is actually saying. A shift of frequency in the spirit. It's higher, it's sharper, it's quicker, it's accelerated. You know, we often say what took a year takes a month, takes a month. This is how God moves. Especially, I mean, the whole physical system is speeding up. Are not the days going quicker? Are the years not absolutely speeding up? Is it not a scriptural principle that there's acceleration? Partly because God can't wait to get us back to himself. Everything's quickening up. In the spirit realm, if it happens in the spirit, you'll know it in the natural as well. Hallelujah. Change of gear, change of acceleration, a change in the atmosphere, a change in frequency, an increase, an enlargement. The word failing spark said, get rid of those tent pegs and pull them out. Get rid of it. No limitation. Let it break out to the left and right. It's happening. I'm not saying this so that we all feel good, but I'm trying to say, Lord, what are you, what are you saying to us? So we know if we're on course, on track, on target, we're not perfect, we've got present day weakness but we're getting glory more and more and more. What is it, Lord? I believe there's a stronger presence of Jesus. There's a fullness coming to the body of Christ, power and glory. And, and here's, the, here's the clue. If something's changed in the spirit, it ought change in the way we walk with God. I mean, it means nothing to say there's a shift in the spirit if nothing's changed in us. What does it mean? It's mulala talk. But if the prayers change, if the level of expectation changes, 
if the mindset is becoming more and more supernatural rather than natural, if the sensing in the spirit is, is there's a greater anticipation that something's going to happen, that is the evidence in your life that there's been a change in the spirit. The kind of prayers change. Far less unbelief is declared in prayer meetings and far more faith is declared. Speaking answers, acknowledging problems but speaking answers. How could you spend a life in prayer meetings where people just keep acknowledging problems? Acknowledge it, speak an answer into it and then thank God for the answer. But the anticipation in our heart needs to change. The faith level needs to change. The love level needs to change. You know, we talked about uh, for a highway of holiness to be built, there's got to be a raising up of the valleys, the deficits, the lack of, lack of Isaiah 30, 40, sorry, the lack of faith, the lack of love, the lack of commitment, that whatever it is where you and I dip into something, fall into something, the lack of self-esteem, the lack of the knowledge of righteousness. You and I will never be more righteous than we are this morning. You can't get more right with God than being right with God. But that should change behaviour. So now you're saying, well, I'm righteous. The righteous are bold as lions. The righteous pray and they get what they ask for, according to 1 John 5, 14. The righteous come boldly to the throne of grace. They're not arrogant and rude. They just know who their father is. They know who they are in Christ. And that relationship is, is, is real rather than the sort of religious concept of the father and the son. You, you and I are in father and son business. I mean, it's the father and his many sons being brought to glory. That's the family business. And it will bear much fruit. So for me, it's like, Lord, what are you saying in this hour? What are you saying to us as a congregation? What are you saying through the prayer meetings? What, what is it through the prophetic that we should be hearing? because that's what God is saying and that's what God requires of us to do. This will cause us to be in line as the, as the church of, of glory, church in the glory, full of the glory. We won't get there any other way but following what the Lord says. So my friends, number one, celebrate the past. Two, skillfully interpret what's happening. Make the necessary changes and adjustments and uh, predict and prepare for the future. I know not everyone's into preparing for the future but last year beginning of last year was at Jeanette, the Lord spoke clearly to Jeanette and said, make abundant preparations. So last year might have even been the year before, two years ago. Make abundant preparations for what I'm about to do. And certain things were put in place, like raw church and a few other things, a few other structures, so that the Lord could actually come and land on something. I mean, the Lord is everywhere, but he needs something that he's given as a blueprint that he can come and inhabit. You know, he doesn't just float around and above the earth. He wants to actually find a place of habitation that's built for him. Isaiah 66, where, what have you built for me? Churches are built for us. You know, as long as I've got comfy chairs, as long as it's to our time limit, as long as you know, Aunt Mary doesn't complain the loudest, we'll sort of keep this thing happening. <laughs> but God says, Isaiah 66, but well, what have you built for me? What attracts my presence? Are you a host of the Holy Ghost, a good host? I mean, if you have someone drop into you and you're a bad host, you refuse to turn the TV off and you're glued to it and occasionally chuck a peanut in his direction, I mean, yeah, well, apart from having monkeys for friends, you, you won't have any quality relationship. But if you say, you know, I, I'm responsible to be a, a good host, you know, if it's appropriate, sometimes you know, <laughs> chuck a peanut's the best thing, but sometimes you just have to be a better host, show interest. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. When he comes on a meeting and he blanketed this this, this morning, but I found the Spirit lifts very easily. When the focus changes and the, the interest level changes and now it's about us and about our issues and whatever, he, he's still with us but the intensity of his presence changes. We need to pick up those changes in the Spirit and go back to when he was really moving. What is it, Lord? What changed? What happened? Have you finished what you were doing? This is how you host the Holy Spirit. It's not a very good phrase, host the Holy Ghost, but what I'm saying is it ought to be conducive for him to move. Heart's right, level of unity, level of word, level of faith, level of humility. These things are important to God. That's how you build a highway for God. Fill up the deficits. And equally as important, bring down the things that rise up against the knowledge of God, the arrogance and the pride and the... You know, the thinking more highly of ourselves and our gifting and calling as if we're something special. You know the cry of the prayer meeting this morning? Lord, we don't know how to do it. 
and without you we can't do it. That was the cry. You'd be proud of us. Just when you thought we were really going to come gung-ho with all this thing worked out, the cry was, God, we don't know how to do this morning. We don't know how to do it. Not really know how to do it. There's certain things we know from biblical patterns. We know that. But Lord, only you know exactly what's needed today. Who needs what and how they need it and how it should come forth. It's not an easy thing. It's an important thing. We're responsible to host the Holy Spirit. It is actually a whole area that I was going to press into but it just doesn't feel right to do that. Hallelujah. There's enough there for you to chew on and the Holy Spirit encourage you. But Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But the church is built with the word proceeding out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4, whatever's proceeding out of the mouth of God, that's the building material for the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we do thank you, Lord God, that you are building, you're building Christ into us. We're building relationships. We're trying to build a community. We're wanting, Father God, to just follow Holy Ghost activity. Uh, We thank you. You haven't left us comfortless. You've sent your spirit. Oh, Jesus, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Why don't we finish with just uh, with the people maybe around you, two, three, four people, and as you talk to each other, find out if there's a need or what is God saying to that person and pray for each other. That would be great. If anyone needs sort of particular healing in that, there'll be a prayer line as well. But just gather a few around you just for a couple of minutes and what is God saying and how can we help and what can we agree on and that would be great. Thank you, Jesus. Just the people around you. Thank you, Lord. What is the Lord saying and how can we help? How can we pray?